You are listening to SelfDiscoveryMedia.com, where illumination and inspiration is but a click away. With so many genre topics for you on everything that you need to know in life, we celebrate and share the people who have taken the journey before you and who are now here to serve you with their wisdom and their knowledge. The next show coming up is... Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of A Kiss from an Author. This is selfdiscoverymedia.com, and I'm your host, Sarah Troy. And my guest today is John North from Australia and from Evolve Publishing. How about publishing your book to get great marketing strategy for any entrepreneur and how to become a number one bestseller in an little as 90 days without writing a single word. Now, I'm bottled by this one, and I'm certainly looking forward to John explaining this. But why do we say to entrepreneurs to write a book? It has, it has become your calling card. It has become something that helps people identify of who you are, what it is that you offer, what kind of person you really are. Is there a synergy? And it is something that really is quite essential for you really to put out there today if you really want people to take you seriously. But you know, you don't want to just do a little type type thing and the self-publishing and it looks like a tatty little thing that you hand out to everyone. Coming from a real proper publisher who does all the guidance that you need and all the promotion that you need is the way to go if you really want to be taken seriously. Now, John didn't always be, wasn't always a publisher. He has a journey to share of how he became this because actually he was an accountant, um, which actually has some benefits when you actually are looking at the structure because he certainly knows structure and we're going to be talking about that in our second show, our business show of how to structure your business and your site automotive. That's going to be coming up. Um, But this one is about the books and he is an author himself. Why was it so important for you to leave the wonderful world of accounting and become an author and follow this path, John? Welcome. Hey, thank you. Greetings from Down Under. <laughs> yes, it's sunny Down Under where we're here in winter Canada. But yeah, a bit warmer here. <laughs> we, we won't let the storms out there bother us. No, not at all. So an accountant, I mean, that's quite a jump. You're normally dealing with numbers. You know, where did the words start coming out of you that wanted to get down on paper? Well, the interesting thing is I've never really ever traded as an accountant. So it's quite funny because I worked for a bank for about mm-hmm. 12 years. So I started the bank was like 15. And, um, and basically I worked part of the incentive for the bank was a study. Mm. And so business studies was obviously the logical thing because they only had certain ones you could do. So I did accounting as one of the tasks, not thinking that that was any more than I said, scam the bank, right? So that I could get paid for this course. And it got interesting. And I mean, I discovered, um, debits and credits and how they balance in the exam. <laughs> so I got funny, this all came to me in the exam. So I feel like I got honors out of that, but I never really ever traded an accountant, but what I realized in later life was that was the mo- one of the most important things I could have ever done. So mm. part of it was when I, was, I had to run my own business, I understood the numbers. And then I understood um, when I was going into publishing, again, very number-based. Everything's so number-based. Mm-hmm. And what I find is a lot of people aren't very number-based. And that's one of the things that um, makes a big difference in marketing. Marketing is just numbers. Mm-hmm. And, and, then, and it's funny that I was just like funny coming with. So most accountants, um, they live in the past. And so basically they don't really look at the future as whereas marketing, you're always looking to the future. You're always looking for hope. So it's quite an interesting mixture. So I sort of, um, when I was like, I don't know, 10 or 11, I used to always want to be a journalist. I was, I was actually going to, I was going to be a journalist. I was going to become, I was going to go and, you know, go to university, go and be a journalist. And I went to this uh, newspaper for about a week to do work experience and, and being impressionable, like whatever young 12, 13 year old, um, she talked me out of it. She actually said, no, no, you shouldn't do it. It's too hard. And obviously she'd been in it for 40 years. So she pretty jaded. So I just thought, oh, I don't sound like a good idea. So I didn't do it. And I just gave up on it. But I was writing a lot of stories and stuff. So, um, you know, I'd always get good prizes for um, at school for stories and, and writing like creative stuff. So, and then I would join the bank. And that was the most uncreative thing you could do because right? you had to follow <laughs> rules, right? Yes. And systems and processes. So it taught me that. And then when I quit the bank and went into IT, that sort of opened up this whole new world of marketing and all that kind of stuff. And then, so what we do is we build systems for people and then we'd sort of like sell accounting software to them. So it helped with the accounting side of things. So it all fell together, um, strangely enough. Funny how things you do in the past 
comes together in the future. But, but that's what it's all about. It's your life yeah. experience, you know, your self-discovery. I mean, mm. as a child, you always knew words, writing, telling a story mm. was important to you. But mm. life kind of puts us on a different path where without the accounting experience, without the bank strategy mm. and systems that need to be in check in order for something to really grow, mm. you wouldn't have been able to actually understand what marketing needed. Exactly, right? yeah. Yeah. Because and people so think marketing is just advertising, you know. <laughs> yeah. and I spent a lot of time learning that sort of stuff. But what happened was, uh, and, and just interesting enough, about uh, I think one of the books I talk about, the five stages, I wrote that book in around two weeks. And the reason I was able to write it in two weeks was that I had all that content from the previous businesses and all the mm. stuff that I'd learned over the years in one sort of big pile of stuff. Like I hadn't ever, didn't have it everywhere, but I had this whole learning library. And so I was able to just like pull that all together and be able to create that book very quickly. Um, and so I think the end of the day is that um, sometimes all that stuff comes up eventually. And that's what happens to a lot of people is that their business, they know their business really well, but they don't write it down much or they don't really put it in some logical fashion. And if you've actually got to sit down and write down how your business operates or how you operate and what you do in a logical fashion, it sets off all these other things that change. So we've had people change their entire business structures because they started to write a book. Mm. So sometimes it's like a blueprint on your, your business, if that's the way you're doing it. So some people are writing, you know, books about their life or stuff like that. But predominantly what we see is people wanting to write books for lead generation for, for, for get, improving their, um, you know, status in terms of the way that they look in the, in the customer's eye. So those things are easy to write. So we always have a log logic and lo legacy books. And what we find is that, they come to us and they want to write a legacy book. And then we go, well, that's hard. Do you realize how hard that is? <laughs> and they go, write a logic book. It's really easy, right? So you can write a logic book because it's all about your business, about the way you do things, and you can do that really quickly. As soon as you start writing a legacy book, you go, oh, I'm going to upset Aunt Mary when I write yes. this, right? And so and we, I had the exact same conversation with something at the squash course the other day where she's going, I was going to just put out one chapter because I, I, this other person in my family will go off at me if she finds out. And it's like, yeah, so that's dragged this thing out for years. Whereas mm -hmm. the logic could have been done in, in, you know, like three months, which we can talk about. But it was kind of like an un funny journey because once we got into marketing and, and I sold the accounting, we, we actually started an accounting software business up and took over as MD, became the second largest accounting distributor in the world for Sage. And what happened was we learned all these marketing things. So I thought, oh, we'll do it for other people. And what we realized was that the book was a missing piece of the puzzle. So we'd go out there and we'd try and create lead generation magnets and all this sort of thing for people. But we can never really, they can nail them down to anything that was great. And then we started writing books. And then we realized putting the book at the front of the, of the marketing, not at the back of it, made a massive difference. And so we just started focusing on books more than marketing as such, you know. So then it yeah. became books first, then marketing, instead of the other way around. Um, well, because like, they get it is like a calling card, isn't it? You know, it's, mm. um, you know, it's one of the problems we have today is oversaturation. There are so many people out there doing what you're doing, you know, not you mm. per se, but what people are offering. And mm. it's, you know, everybody, it's a competitive market. It doesn't have to be, you know, mm. uh, you're not one size that's going to fit all. So you no. need to find your client that really, mm. you know, is on the same wavelength. There is a synergy there. How are they going to know that? Well, by reading your book, they're going to know, you know, this person's, addressing some of my issues in my business or I, you know, yeah. we're on the same Thank wavelength you. here. Yeah, I really too. like what they're saying here. And so that relationship build, which you need to have in any form of business has already kind of been established on this side yeah. of the book um, mm -hmm. because you know what you're getting, you know who this person is, and what they're going to be offering you. And now you can really start building that relationship in whichever area it's going. So, you know, gone are the days where it's, here's my business card and, you know, mm. and, you know, let's get down to business. People want to know who they're doing business with today. Yeah, they need to know them personally. And the thing, yeah. funny thing too is that when you talk about oversaturation, it's quite interesting. There's a, a, a sort of an old thing called articular, track, articular tracking system, whatever. So what happens is if you buy a car, you see everybody else with the same car. Yes. And so... Um, what's interesting in this marketplace is that the last time you sat on a plane, how many best-selling authors did you sit beside? And mm. chances are no one. Like mm. how, how many best-selling authors do you meet in daily life? Hardly anybody. And so what happens is um, you have a situation where you think it's a lot of out there because you see a lot of it. 
but the general public, your customer does not see that. Right. And so he thinks, wow, book, you know, and, and so it's a very different kind of perception from the other side of the fence. If you're dealing with, say, if you're writing books, like we wrote a book on how to publish a book, um, one of the things that you're going to kind of get into is a book publishing market. And so in that stage, you know, you might have a situation where, um, you know, you are going to see more of them. But generally speaking, most people don't know many best-selling authors. Right. So it's yeah. pretty... Mm. And, and also, you know, don't, you know, it's like with, with podcasting, don't go and do it for fame and fortune. You know, it's, um, you're going to reach the people that you're going to reach that are ready to hear. And the mm. same with your book. It's, you know, you're not going to be JK Rowling or the bestseller or Deepak Chakra or whatever else is out there, mm. you know, Anthony Robbins. It's, mm. it's a personal book on your work, on you for your yes. clientele. Should mm. it grow? Should it be something that expands from that? That is fantastic. But if you're going in to be the number one bestseller, um, your content is going to change, isn't yes, it? Your strategy. It's a vision strategy. Yeah. And when we, whenever we talk to people when I go to do books, I talk to them and we go through the strategy call and they always don't want to do it. There's two things the authors don't want to do. One is actually talk about what their book's going to be about, at, you know, like strategy-wise. They're happy to talk about what they're going to write, but they don't want to talk about the strategy behind it. And secondly, they don't want to write their bio. Mm. Um, so they're shocking about buyers. So usually, <laughs> that's the one that you know we'll try and get them to help them do that because it's something they have to do themselves to a degree. Like people can write bios, but I really think that you have to really get into a buyer yourself. And 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 basically, a bio is not what you think it is. It's not about you as such. It's about how you help people. Yeah, it's a so mission, really, a isn't bio. it? Mm. Yeah, it's it's not a it's not a resume. It's not a no. list of things, achievements you've done so much. A longer bio, yes. But a shorter buyer is really snappy about what you do um, and, and telling them what you're about and getting the essence of you, but not a not big long list of all these awards you've won. And so that's what they do. They get into like what, you know, who you are, not what you are. Right. right. And also, you know, are you just a bragger? You know, mm. are you resting on your laurels? Or, mm, you know, yeah. I, I want to know what, what is your mission statement? Why are you doing it? Exactly. Who are yeah. you really wanting to serve? If it's mm. all about I'm the number one, I'm this and that, then what I'm hearing is ego. Mm. Yes. You know, do you actually have time for me? Mm. Whereas mm. if somebody's speaking to you and I'm doing this because this matters to me, then mm. you're going to go, oh, I feel, I feel where he's coming from or she's mm. coming from. Um, mm. And then there's a bigger connection, isn't there? If you've won mm. awards down the road, fantastic. Yep. But first and foremost, it should be mm. for why. Yeah, so we sort of like, and it's interesting tip like we try to do, we sort of like, we'll say best-selling author and say cardiologist or best-selling mm. author and, and, and business coach who helps people, like for us, we say help people become massively successful. And so you want to sort of say who you are, but then how that extends and what right. that means to them. And that's a bit we, we always have trouble with buyers. And second part, strategy, right? So they go, um, where's the story going to start? Where's it going to end? And what's the next steps? What's the journey, right? And that's where people get sort of hung up. They kind of like, because um, a book will never finish if you don't have a table of contents, right? You're right. So what happens is people try to write a book and then try to write the table of contents later. We always write it first. Um, so we always do the book title, cover, and the table of contents first. It's backwards, right? People right. go, oh, that's backwards, isn't it? No, it's not. It's like a Tarantino, right? You know it's how it's, the story is going to end before you write the story. Um, because otherwise you have no plan. And, and I can guarantee that any movies that are made are not written from start to finish right mm -hmm. they, they agonize over the end more than the, than the start sometimes right yes. and so it's, it's a very you know creative structure and if people have never written a book that's what they're going to do they're going to try and write this book and that's where the myth gets into it where they think they need to lock themselves in a log cabin for, for for six months and write this book which they'll never do anyway because they don't they don't they're not writers by by default so if you're a writer you get up every day and you write a blog or something and that's what you do every day then you're a writer but these guys are authors. And so we always say that authors get paid better than writers. Mm. And so you want to focus on being an author. And, and Tony Robbins, for example, doesn't necessarily write his old, all his books either. He's, you know, a lot of those books are written by other people based on what he tells them to write. Right, exactly. So yeah. he's an author. He, and does it matter, make any difference? No, because it's still his ideas. Mm -hmm. It's just that someone's slightly better at articulating. You think, you know, the presence of the, of the United States, except maybe the current one you've got, um, you know, they write their own, you know, like America's got... You know, like you, they write their speeches for them. It's very scripted. I was watching um, this morning Wars show that's come up on Apple Plus TV recently and, and it 
it's they talk about the fact that it's totally scripted that morning show that they do is totally fully scripted and so they know what they're going to say beforehand they don't make it up and that's the trouble when you try and write a book from start to finish because you're trying to make it up you know right oh you know there's too much information and how do you filter it down and by actually kind of knowing what your chapters are going to be um Mm. it has you focus in well Mm. i'm not going to put that in this chapter that really belongs over there instead of trying to make it top heavy or just too much information in one chapter (laughs) yeah and and there's kind of two two streams of that too some people will say i don't want to tell them all my secret sauce i want to tell them how to do things Mm and people are going to steal my ideas and I got a, well, number, number one reason is most ideas nobody ever implements, they're too lazy. So chances are they'll never do it. And if they do get an idea, they've still, still got to actually get it to market and do it. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be the same as your idea. So there are some things that we don't put in our books, but most of it we tell them because we may as well, because might, your best customer might not even read your book. That's what we say a lot of times because they'll look at your book and they'll flip through it and they go, oh, that looks interesting. I, I need this person. I need this mm-hmm. guy to help me. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, some people read the book and cover to cover, get something out of it, great. So then they're going to come up to you and go, hey, look, I read your book and I did this and I made some money or whatever. That's the best thing you never hear, right? So you don't want a light, fluffy thing, but people set themselves up for failure, right? So they want to write a, a 600-page book um, and they want it to be this huge thing that, you know, and, and the trouble is they set themselves up for failure in the first place. So we set themselves up. I was saying business now, you should work out the laziest way to do something is the best one, right? The laziest, cheapest way sometimes is the best way, right? Um, and so sometimes setting up a book up, like we say, like 45,000 words, 40 to 45,000 words, not a lot, you can record that book in a day, right? Technically, you could actually sit down and speak that book in a day. Um, and it's not, a, it's not an expensive book to print and it makes um, economic sense to sell because it's not too expensive. So the whole model fits, right? Once you get above that, it becomes complicated and difficult. Um, and I actually had an author the other day that come to me and she's written this children's book and she's written it in such a way that it's all got to be particular, especially printed in China because it's the only place you can do it cheaply. Um, and it's got fold out things in it and all that sort of stuff. And I said to her, and her husband's upset because he's saying, well, you know, you're going to spend $20,000 build, you know, getting these prototypes printed and, and, you know, short runs done and stuff. And would you ever sell them? And also, and she's an accountant, by the way. <laughs> and, and so, so I, I go, um, have you set yourself up to fail here? Have you deliberately done this so that you can actually not do this? Because what she's done is she's created this problem around this book. She's written this book, but the printing process and the way that it develops is expensive. And she's never sold a book before. She doesn't have any any mm. following, she has nothing. I said, you're going to print these books and they're going to sit in your garage and they're going to sell them because you've got no strategy around it. All right. See what I mean? What it goes wrong. But I think she's actually set herself up perhaps to actually fail in the first place so she doesn't do it because she's made it too complicated. Right. right? Or seen somebody else's book that's done it, but that, but actually has been, you know, maybe mm. you know, backed by a big uh, what's the name, publisher that's paid it to do it and they can afford to do that because they Back do that risks. all the time. So, uh, but those are the few and far between, mm. you know, um, old publishing is making themselves obsolete a, a lot of the time by their process. You know, they're exactly. not really going with the times. You have an awful lot of people now self-publishing and that has kind of proven not to be that successful because where is the marketing and there's flaws in it and a number mm-hmm. of other things. So people are looking for that publisher that is, um, is actually going to get on with it uh, mm. because with the old publishing, it's like, well, yes, in a couple of years because we've got a backlog or, yeah. you know, when we get to it. Um, yeah. But somebody who's going to get into it and actually guide you properly along the way and not expect you mm. to know every step that you're doing. Yeah. So it is it is a new publishing type of paradigm, isn't it, that's um, mm. out there that um, whether it's business or not, whether, as you said, you, you um, Gina Gardner is um, mm. the one oh, that introduced oh. me to you and she's done mm. a lot of books in the past with other people mm. and now she's with you and she's very happy with you. That's the reason why she sent me over to you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's one can't just think about the book. Mm. Oh, now I've got a book. It's now what? If you mm. want anybody to read that book, if you want anyone to actually have any impact from that book, yes, mm. it's great to hand out to clients. Yes, it's great maybe at a networking event, but you really want to actually get it sold because that gets it in more hands. That's then right. what are you going to do? And mm. that's where the, the fall down happens, isn't it? Is, you know, mm. I've self-published, I've got a book, now what? They have no marketing strategy at all. 
funny thing is that a lot of times when they finish publishing the book and they publish the book, they think they're finished. Yes. Uh, it's so. just begun. <laughs> it's just begun, right? And then they're so sick of it by then. Mm-hmm. It's what we've gone through it for years. Like taking, sometimes I've, I've come to people and said, oh, I've spent years getting this thing done. And they're so tired from it. They, haven't got time to, they don't want to market anymore. They just put it aside and tick it off. It's being done. And so it's very dangerous. It happens. So that's, that, that's what we kind of talk about the 90 day scenario. Yeah. Is that a, a burst of activity on a, on a quarterly basis is the best thing in business. So, you know, it's like a monthly, you know, it's been proven that, you know, like an agile business have a quarterly kind of target and a monthly kind of goals will get you somewhere because it's short term thinking because nowadays you can't long term think too much because things change so much. So what your idea is, is that you think out three months. So by writing a book in three months, you're not too tired from it. And, and we've got a couple of authors that dragged this thing out and they're getting tired. Right. And so we say, look, if you just burst through this and got it done in the time frame in three to four months, you would have been finished and the book would have been out then you would have been making money from it. But what you've done is drag this thing out because, and I can guarantee most of the time they do that is because they get self-doubt. So they start wondering whether they can really do it, um, whether it's going to be any good, worrying about what other people think about it, all those things. And then the well-meaning friends kick in and then they start telling them things about, oh, I don't think the cover's right and I don't think your title's right. And it's like, how many pub books have they published? Um, and, you, and these well-meaning friends are so dangerous, I've found, because they mm-hmm. don't know anything about what they're talking about. The people that matter are the people who are going to put their credit cards up to buy the book. They're the people that matter, not your friends, family, um, mm-hmm. you know, well-meaning art that's going to tell you stuff that's totally unrelated to what you're talking about, and that's part of the problem. Um, so this whole self-doubt thing kicks in. So three months you can get through that quickly. You don't have time to think about it, right? Um and the other thing too is that the way that you create content, people think you've got to sit in front of a typewriter or a computer and write this thing from end to end. And what it, you want to try is do rapid content. So recording your content yourself if you're a talker. Um, some people aren't talkers and they have to write it, but most people can talk out what they, they do in a logical way. Recording, transcribing, and not worrying about editing until the end. Yeah. And so... Um, the idea is you actually just get all your stuff together, lump it together, make a mess, make it, it, it often looks like a mess. Like I've said a few authors at the time, so like, this is a mess, they think. I go, no, it's not. It'll, it'll come together, you watch. And as you put the pieces together and suddenly it's a Lego thing, you know. Like, mm-hmm. um, and so it matters. But So what we've done is we kind of work with what I call a hybrid author or hybrid publisher. And so what happens is there's a bridge between publishing, gener- you know, traditional publishing, the two things that I don't like about it, one is they kind of own your book, so they own your content. Yes. When yes. they you sign that contract, you, you very much kiss it goodbye. Yeah. Um, and they don't really, they're not called book marketers, they're called book publishers. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they don't really market your book because they want your your list to market. They want you to go and bust your bum to get it. And so it's kind of like the marketing is not really there as such unless you get a big, you know, big deal, and that's pretty rare, right? So you're going to get probably chewed up in the system, not sell many books. Then you've got to buy the books from them as well. Um, yeah. Often that's expensive. Um, so what we do can say, okay, we don't, we don't, you don't own the content with us. Like you, you own the content. We don't own anything. Um, you can do whatever you like there. We share the royalties are much bigger. They're usually going to give you 30% of the royalties on average, even less sometimes. We'll give them 70%. Right. But then what we do is we're kind of taking them as a sub-published author and publishing them on a traditional kind of publishing model, but they retain the benefits of being self-published. But they, they stick our brand on top of it, so at least it looks to the outside world. And I have these people agonise over this, by the way. They look in and go, oh, if I'm self-published, I said, well, there's a couple of options there. One is um, put uh, get, a, get another business name and put it in there. <laughs> um, but the reality is the publisher can be anything. It's not, um, and nobody looks anyway, right? Nobody picks up a book and goes, I want to publish this book. Um, they don't, unless they see Penguin or some of those big publishing right. names. People don't look and go, who's that? I'm going to look them up on the internet and research and find out who this publishes before I buy the book. They're not doing that. So that's all stuff that you think is important, not necessarily important to, the, to your customer. What's important to your customer is what you can do for them, not um, who published the book. Yeah, um, and, and having interviewed an awful lot of self-publishers and, mm. and I, I would say uh, men are guilty of this is always the black book with the red writing. Yes. Um, and you know, it is so hard to read, 
and mm -hmm. really kind of unappealing. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, we, we think we have this great idea and really this is where you need somebody who is in the business mm -hmm. and go, oh, no, let's, let's try looking at something else, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was um, a guy that was putting his site together and he is a, a driving instructor. And he had everything in black and blood red. And I said, now you've got to think about this. A mother is the one that's going to mm. buy your services for Rinds their kid. It's a bad color when you teach right. people how to drive, I've got to tell you. And you think, if a car crash and blood, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it doesn't scream safety, right? Yes. You know, and, uh, oh, mm. I don't think about that. So this is why, you know, doing it on your own isn't mm. always a good idea. This is why you do need somebody that you're looking at it from the strategy, the layout, you're looking at it from the presentation, you're looking at it, you know, from, you know, um, putting the content in the right context, but yes. also the, how it is marketed. It mm. does it have the marketing appeal? Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, does the book, are very important. Oh, yes. hugely important. And mm. the title, mm. you know, uh, yeah. that always gets me because I'm, I like a long title and it's how do you put it in one or two words that has the impact and uh, yeah, I say to a lot of people they put either the titles are really short or really long right yeah. so when you get the really long title I said can you be able to tell if someone you're on tv and says what's your book called and you have to tell them this big long book name half an hour later and you're trying to give them the title yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, right? it's like by the time we go what was that book called again yeah exactly it's kind of like nice snappy short titles and nice long subtitle because subtitle yes. Um, and it's funny, we did a, a cover uh, competition sometimes. So we'll put out um, all these different types of covers and we'll get people to vote on them. And a few of them said, oh, this, this title's too long. You know, it's like, okay, but your opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> because what's happened there is you think the title is long because you're looking artistically at the book. What we know is that the title is, is a Google search engine mm. thing, you know. So the title, of, subtitle of the book becomes your, your what they call long tail kind of search solution in Amazon. So when people type in marketing or business or entrepreneurs or all those different keywords, they're going to find your book. So right. a long subtitle is designed to do that. Right. People don't tend to write long subtitles and think it looks, but they can write a really nice one. Um, I mean, we wrote one that said how to pay your house off within seven years without becoming a hermit. Right. <laughs> And, and so it's funny, right? Yes. And, and it, it's, it, it, I'm going to be a hermit. And that, it sets the book, right? But paying your, your mortgage off within seven years, that's the kind of key words we're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. And But we've tied it into a nice snappy subtitle. Right. And so that's, that's what you've got to be careful of. And it's all about strategy. So what happens is when we get someone who's written a book and comes to us and says, I've written this book and I've done the cover and I've done everything, can you just publish it? Okay, no worries. But the reality is when I look at it, I go, um, what if they got it right? And you start asking questions. We're writing an interesting book at the moment called about executive loneliness. Mm. And it's an interesting subject because suicide rates and everything are much higher in this, in this field. And the, the, when we had this session and the, and the author wanted that title, I actually said, okay, let's just reset things and talk about this. Is it, is executive loneliness something that people Google? Is it in Amazon? Mm. And through this whole process and we looked it up and it wasn't right. It wasn't very popular. Right. And, and, but the thing is, it's something that people don't want to talk about. Right. And so the subtitle has got that. So we took, we decided in the end after, after an hour of him talking about it and pitching it and so oh, it's, it's a good name. Like the reaction you gave you when I said it, you know, people mm -hmm. connect straight away to what it yep. means. We said, it's a thing that no one, hardly anybody talks about. And that's part of the subtitle. Right. So now yes. you're starting a movement around something that's not popular necessarily. It's not search much for what we can see, but it's starting to be written about. So we found some really good articles about it. So it's been written about, not very popular, but good enough. Now that's not a that's a dangerous place to go, because if nobody's looking, say, oh, I'm too much competition. But the reality is, you want competition because nobody's going to be searching it otherwise, right? right? Yes. Start this new widget thing that no one has, that no one knows about. You're going to spend all the money to get to market, and then someone will copy you, and then you won't. And they'll beat you in my marketing, right? Right. So. It's very dangerous to do that, but we always search on Google. But this particular scenario made sense. It's a good strategy. It's what he's talking about. It's what his organization's about. It makes a lot of sense, right? And that strategy works. That could have been a totally complete screw up if it hadn't been thought out properly. Right. And I've seen it before. I got a book recently. I looked, somebody that asked me to look at it and look and I thought, okay, what's this book about? It looks like a HR book. And it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was a book on how millennials could get better, um, get um, more um, 
sort of promotions and stuff inside a business. So it's more written for millennials. But the way it was done and the colouring and the way it was the cover was done looked to me like just a HR book. And I said, you said, I can't sell it. I don't can see why. Very nice yeah. cover, but it's not the strategy's wrong. Right. And I think, you know, as a personality coach and, and interviewed quite a number of people through the years, um, mm. we have to also look at, you know, our perspective might come from, you know, the strategist or it might come from uh, the um, I see it, I believe it, or it might come from I want to do it. You've got to look yeah. at what is our perspective because that's how you write it and how you present it is from your perspective. <laughs> which it needs to be but if you don't put an invitation in there mm. or don't write in there addressing other people's perspective yep. you know then you're just going to be just one channel you're not going it's to boring. hear the it's about you right yeah yes. we, wrote a book, we wrote a book recently um about uh it's called a swiss made egyptian so it's quite a neat name right? <laughs> yes. um and in reality was is that it doesn't really tell you what it's about it's, he's written this medical um, website to allow all these people to become interns and eventually become, um, you know, qualified in the medical area. Um, but it, when we spoke to him initially, I said, look, honestly, I said, your story is interesting, but it's not that exciting. Mm -hmm. And I said, what we really need to understand is how your journey went and what you went about, right. how you got there. Yeah. And also give us some tips and hints about what you should do along the way. And so we build a success path into that actual book. And that's something that we've seen a lot of. And I, I sort of learnt this off a, of someone who's doing courses and said he'd done thousands, like he was involved in one of the biggest uh, wishlist member, one of the WordPress one. And he'd sent 50,000 courses. And he said the single reason why most people fail in courses is that they get overwhelmed, they're given too much information. Mm -hmm. And the second part is a journey to know where they're going to and where they're finished, you know, where they're at on the journey. And so what we found was that if you can actually like five, like we have my book's called Five Stages in Criminal Success, we kind of broke it into five chunks of mm -hmm. pieces of the process. And what happened was we now very clear about each chapter, what it's all about, how you're moving, where you are on the journey. Also, we know where the customer is. So if someone comes like we've got, you've got founder, you've got explorer, you've got um, investor, you've got time master, right? all those stages and people will go, where are you on that stage? Now, if they're at the high end of the stage or towards the end of the journey, they're not really your customer, are they? No. Because they're already there almost, right? But you want people in the early stages or the middle stages. So then you can actually tailor your, what I call a customer journey through that book. So when they get to the end of the book or halfway through the book or read the first chapter of the book, doesn't really matter. But where do they do next? What goes, what happens next? And that's the bit that people don't do. Well, what will I do after I read this book or what should I do? Like make yes. it interactive, put some worksheets Absolutely. in that people have to download. All those things get put in as an afterthought, right? Yes. Um, and it's messy then. It doesn't look cohesive. It doesn't look like it was planned and it looks tacky, right? And so by thinking those things out, so where's, okay, they buy the book. What happens next? What happens after that? Do they come to me? Um, and often I talk to authors, they go, oh, no, they can't really come to me. I haven't really got anything to sell them. It's like, why are you writing this book exactly? Um, oh, I want to help people. And I go, well, that's the most, most dangerous thing you can ever do in publishing is when you want to help people. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is no good deed goes unpunished, right? So what will happen is you'll end up in a situation where you'll try to help all these people. Who's your customer? Everyone. Male, female, doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you've made this thing so broad, it doesn't mean anything to anyone. Right. Yeah. Right? Nobody so, knows who they're being. Are you mm -hmm. speaking to me? Are you speaking yeah. to me? I don't know because you just exactly. whitewashed it so much, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually it an awful lot like MLMs in a lot of ways. They, mm. they, yeah. they are pitching to the mm. people who will follow and do yeah. as instructed and they're yeah. pitching to the people who want a quick turnover. Right. The other people are being completely left out. They're not being spoken to at all. Yeah, so and so you push them away. So yeah. yes. one of my authors, he's, he's about to do his fourth book. He's one of the most LinkedIn viewed LinkedIn profiles in the world. He um, probably chases away more people than he attracts in some mm -hmm. respects because what he's doing, he's trying to push away people that aren't going to fit his personality. He's quite, he's got a mohawk, you know, he's got a mohawk. He's a CEO of marketing and he's got a mohawk. So it's very, people who don't like that, he's got mohawks and tattoos, right? Right. So, some people are going to be pushed away by that. And he's quite happy with that. He wants to do that because there's no point doing business with someone who's going to be offended by him, right? And so he tracks the right sort of customers from right. the get from his cover. 
So the people who actually, you know, with them, who are willing to look at the content and not judge the cover. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and it's kind of funny thing is, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Everybody does. Yes. <laughs> yes. Everybody judges well, everybody I, by what they look like. It's you know? the book cover that is your first invitation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's the first it's inspiration. You know, if it is, is it the color? Is it the title? Is it something there? I mean, when I go looking for a book in a bookstore, I let a book come out and speak to me. Yes. Uh, and it's a, uh, oh, interesting. And then literally mm -hmm. go through, oh, this is something I need right now. Um, mm -hmm. But if the, you know, one of the problems, and especially in this entrepreneurial type um, publishing and marketing, is that there's too much same old. You yeah. know, a lot of people are using the same dialogue. Um, and it, it just, be, you know, mm -hmm. becomes drowning out because uh, what mm -hmm. makes you different? Um, exactly. You know, don't... Uh, Stop pitching yourself. This is not yeah. a pitch. It's an mm. invitation. It's an inspiration for invitation and mm. not a pitch because if it's a pitch, you know, you need the elevator one at 30 seconds, not a whole book of it. Um, That's right. It's, yeah, it's and I mean, to me, it's a why. conversation. Like, mm -hmm. to me, it's a Absolutely. conversation starter. So people look at it as they, well, well, how do I do this? And so we'll make, it's a conversation. It's a starter conversation with someone. Interesting enough, in, in, um, in my iPhone for Microsoft emails, they don't call them emails, they call them conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So the big and guys know We call this. organic conversations here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why Facebook's now investing heavily in the three, their three messaging platforms because, and investing in encryption and stuff like that because they see messaging as the future, not yes. feed, not, not Facebook feed. You know, they feel yeah. that feeds will go away. Personal group messaging and all that sort of stuff will be the future. Now, that's a conversation, Right. And people want conversations. They don't want to be pitched to necessarily. They no. want to know what's in it for them. So, you know, I saw a guy the other day, one of my, my, um, one of my friends who runs a squash court, and he put this, he shows, he shows me his side of his car and he says, uh, we're going to, you know, screen print uh, the car and get some business. And he's put his name across the, of the car, right? And, yes, the business name and, the, and, the, um, and squash relate because they're, you know, in that area, right? it's local. But the reality was, I said, you're, you put your ego at the top. You put your name at the top, mm -hmm. right? No one cares about you until you care about that. They, that they, you care yes. about them. Exactly. And so I said, you put your name at the top, right? And yes, you will get some business. But the reality is, why didn't you put why you want to play squash? Right. Why you want to, yeah. um, why would you come to you? Why would you deal with you? Why would you start doing these things? And so you no benefits, no real reason to do business with you. And I think that's the classic mistake people do in books too. They'll, I kind of put, they'll overstate themselves trying to make themselves look good when it's really, they've got to make their customers look good. They've got to feel connected to their customers in the way that they normally connect their personality, right? So right. the book must express their personality. It can't you know, be. as, as a customer, you want to know that this is a relationship you're having with mm. someone that they're there mm. to truly listen to what you need. They hear you. I mean, and case in point, you, um, mm. I have built this platform blueprinted mm. two years ago. It is mm. what my heart and soul wants to do. It then it was, and people could see it and they love the idea of it. But mm. what I didn't have, which we will be talking a lot about in your second show, yeah. was that was the building blocks and the strategy okay. to bring mm. it about. And mm. the problem is, I've spoken to a number of people, and mm. I, you know, I spoke to you about my blueprint. But what came back was you gave me the building blocks. You gave yeah. back with the strategy of what needed in order for it to be implemented. That's the thing about listening. And mm. your book should invite to hear someone. You know, mm. does it speak to me? Do I have, when I put this book down, an awful lot of questions for you? Mm. Because mm. you've invited that conversation, that interaction, exactly. right? I feel you were talking to me. Mm. Can we have a further conversation? Because mm. if, if you don't do that, if it's all about, and I'm this and I'm that and ah, da, da, it's about you. It's not about mm. your customer. That's right. And I think you've got to remember that when you're talking to people. And yeah. I think, um, you know, one thing I find with a lot of the people I like, so when I speak to someone that comes to me, the first thing I'm looking for is ego. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if they've got a big ego, I'll, I'll tend to run away from them. Right. Because what happens is, Ego is dangerous, particularly mm -hmm. in books. Mm -hmm. So you need to put the ego at the door and you actually need to be like, for me, one of my, I guess one of my superpowers is you can't insult me. <laughs> right? Oh, so darling, I was going one. to try. Right? <laughs> right? So the reason why is because I don't take anything personally, right? right? 
and people can say things. And, and you know, for example, my book cover, which I was trying to look around before, is I put my face on the front cover for a reason originally. I never really liked it. And some people, when, this is a big one actually, People, some people can handle their face on the front cover and people, some people can't. Mm-hmm. And we've seen this quite a few times where they'll put it up there and they go, no, 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 just take it off. I don't like it. I don't look like looking at myself. And and that's that's an not that an ego issue. That's a that's also a um, sort of a, a you know, problem with you with the way you perceive yourself. Mm-hmm. But when I was looking at the book cover, it wasn't about that. It was in the photo. I wasn't happy with the photo. But the reality was is that the strategies change now. So we yeah. actually went on the five stages, and we put a five stages image up there. So originally, Tom, I put the book cover up there because I didn't have anything to sell. So right. one thing interesting, we changed the cover to suit the strategy ongoing. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean the cover can't change. It's fiddly to change. It wasn't too bad. But the reality was we changed our strategy. So we, we, we took my photo off because it's not important. Anymore. I'm not important on the front cover anymore. Right. Right. It's not ego. It's mm-hmm. not being insulted. It's sometimes not important. The system's important. Yeah. And so you, that's the thing. And, and people put their faces on the front cover and they, sometimes it's horrible <laughs> when they take the photos, right? Yes. It's like because they want to put their, because ego puts them there. Yeah. Right. So don't put your face on the front cover if ego doesn't put you there. Right. So Chris puts his face on the front cover because he wants people to see who he is and what he stands for from the get-go. So it's not ego so much that puts a face on the front cover. It's because it's a strategy around his right. photo. So, yes. yeah. So it's dangerous. So ego is the worst, most dangerous thing you can do in publishing um, because ego, they make mistakes in decisions based around ego. What will people think of me, right? All these things that come out of that ego thing that are actually dangerous. Um, and, so, and, you know, as an, as an interviewer of authors, you know, it is not marketable. Um, huh. You know, I've interviewed people where I really have liked the content of their book, mm. but they kind of misrepresented themselves. You know, mm. is this book Did a you write that book? person? <laughs> exactly. Maybe they didn't write that book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's, uh, yeah. it's the same with websites. You know, mm. does your site, mm. when somebody goes in and go, yeah, this is you, yes. right? This is you because ultimately you mm. are selling yourself and what yeah. you have for this person. So it must always represent you don't have it misconstrued. Try but, not trying to be something else. Like that's the trouble. Yeah. People try to be something else. You can only pretend so long. So that I've seen websites where you look and they go, this is nothing like what they are like. No, no. Nothing like what they, they do yeah. or say. No. And why? Because someone else did it because they thought that was a good right. way to look. And, you know, right. it's the trend to look this way and the trend to look mm. that. Well, you're going to be out of that trend in two years and you're going to have to cough up more money to have it all redone again. Exactly um, right. So, you know, save yourself some money and go with something that really is going to test more the, uh, of time, that, that it's really going to grow with time, right? Mm. And, you know, it's, it's sad when you've got some great content and, and the ego, mm. you know, I call them the grandstanders. Mm. If it's not a two-way conversation, it's just mm. basically them for the mm. hour and you manage to get a word in now and again we call them show ponies in australia I don't know whether right that no that's a thing. it's a good one you know um and the, th- the thing is is that they didn't start off that way you know i, no. I say that they no. started off with the great content and everything else but because of their popularity they mm. started drinking their own kool-aid and that's where the ego started stepping in and you've got to be very careful with that because yes. you know um if you're putting out a book, it's there everywhere. It yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if you're putting out a book, whether somebody picks it up today or picks it up three years from now, you want to still be consistent. You can evolve and yes. grow, but the core of who you are and what you stand for should mm. always be there and not now you're too important to talk to anyone else. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I spoke to a fairly uh, a granddaddy of the internet marketing yesterday and it was a conversation and he was so relaxed and he was so open and, and, and I looked at him and thought, well, this guy's genuine, right? I really mm. liked him because when I had the conversation and I've had conversations with some of these guys, like he said, you know, very different. He said, I do what I say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I said, well, that's refreshing to hear because a lot of people tell you stuff and then do nothing. Right. And I was very encouraged by him because I felt he was open. He was, he was honest. He was real. And some people just think that they've got to behave a certain way. Yes. And, and the show ponies in our life, they work, right? If you look at some of these big guys, like that, they have big followings. People follow them because they basically kind of um, stand out and they, they get people to react and have opinions. You know, the thing is, is most people go into something because in their self-discovery, 
um, of, of things that they've learned in life they want to share with others. Mm-hmm. You know, they've acquired some skills and some tools and it's now become their platform and their purpose in life and they want to share it. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden, it, you know, it becomes more about them than it does about the service that they're giving other people. And yeah. I think, you know, if they, they're being mindful, but I also think being mindful is first and foremost, but it's also being connected to heart. You know, yeah. the moment that your heart becomes disconnected, you've forgotten why you're doing it. Yeah. And you're putting out this book, yes, as a marketing ploy, um, yes, as a way of getting new clients, yes, as a way of giving a service to people. But mm. kind of keep some humility yeah. in there, and you know, and that it's always got to come from the heart because ultimately, whatever your popularity is on the surface, if there isn't a heart behind it, you're going to get forgotten. Mm, exactly. Yeah. I've got a client we've just published a book course called Energy to Lead. And she we spoke about this book three or four years ago and she started it and she dropped out of it. She just stopped doing it. <clears throat> and she wouldn't finish it. And it's taken her three or four years to get to a point where she was ready. Yes. Right? And now when I read the book, it's 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 much, much nicer. It's a better feel. It's all about the way she wants to talk. Before it was too logical. She was mm. talking too logically. She didn't really I don't know, attached don't to it material as, as well as she thought she did either. Mm. So it took a couple of years to actually get her head around what she really was about. And that's the one thing about books. I tell you, it's a, it's a litmus test to your own business model, the way you operate, the way you think it's, it's the best business plan you can ever write. Yes. Yes. So, you know, there's, know? there's an author called, um, um, Ricky Ruski, he's a, a pilot and he wrote a wonderful book called uh, Just Two Choices. You know, he says like, the engine is on, the engine is off. You're going to react accordingly. And, you yes. know, you talked about diagrams. It's a very thin book and it's a very to the point and it's yep. got the diagrams in there of simplifying and it's, mm-hmm. it's just a very logical, simplifying, thoughtful book, yes. beautifully colored and yes. straight to the point, but keeping it light. And he is this person. And that's the yeah. beauty of it. You know, when you're interviewing, I want the person who's written the book to be the person, right? Mm. And not um, a different image of it. And I think that's the thing. If you put yourself on the page, in, in not from the ego standpoint, but from the mm. sharing of that information, you know, mm. it will pour out. You know, mm. we talked about me doing my book and I was yeah. going to go, you know, I had this whole thing about the angel being assigned to me and oh boy what a life she's had you know and you said no you know the journey that I've actually had in the podcasting and the way it's evolved and the Mm. way it's growing the people that have touched me and the people that we've touched you that's the way to go and I hadn't thought about that you know I thought that would be book two not book one so this is why we need someone like you to Mm. you know put us on the right path you know Mm. uh help us lay it out because there's an awful lot of people whose books should be out there they've got well, stories to be told share. yeah yeah Absolutely. and yeah. and oh i don't know i have yes you do your story mm. is an inspiration and you know it may not be a self-help book or but it, the book itself and the journey that you've achieved mm. the strength and the courage and uh, what you've gone through and how you've mm. gone through it and what you're doing now is that inspiration that invites people to believe that they too can go through it. And mm. uh, there is no story too small. It's just a question yeah. of how it's told. Well, I've got a book called, um, one of my author's early authors, a book called by Michael Croslin. It's worth looking up. It's called Kids Don't Get Cancer. Mm-hmm. And he got cancer at one and survived it. And, right. and you couldn't kill Michael with a baseball bat, right? He's so tough. Um, <laughs> But he's so sweet in some respects. Yes. So, but he's he's got a speaking. He does speaking engagements now, and his speaking engagements and his business has grown exponentially. And it's got a lot to do with his book because what happens when he speaks is that's great. He leaves an impact on the people he speaks to, but they don't walk away with anything. Mm. And so, walking away with a book and his yes. book strategy is basically um, some. He doesn't even promote his own book. He does his talk. The guy that does the introduction promotes his book for him essentially. He walks to the back of the room, hugs people and signs them and he sells lots of books. That's his sales strategy. Yes, <laughs> yes. Right? Um, I think he just a hug fest. I think he does it for that reason. So but the reality <laughs> is he sells lots of books because they're connecting to him, right? Yeah. They're connecting to the story and then it moves on. Um, and we did they're that taking that story more. home with them. Yeah, they, but yeah. they're connecting. They want to take a piece of him away. Yeah, right? yeah. He's done a great yeah. job of connecting that together. We put one chapter in there about help, how to help themselves in this process because it's all about hope, really. It's all about, yes. you know, you can get through this. Don't. And most people who die from cancer 
I say most people, but a lot of people who died from cancer probably shouldn't have because they lost hope that it let them get them to an end and they started making decisions and stuff that stuffed them up. And so his whole strategy is like, there is hope. Like you can see that I had very no hope. Like he had a 1% chance of surviving this at one. Right. And he got through and he's had heart attacks and all sorts of stuff over the years. But the reality is that there's hope there and that's what he's trying to get out. And, and he goes regularly goes to hospitals and sees sick children to actually get hope. Mm-hmm. And there's one book we actually published for, for one of his, um, uh, friends, if you like, she, he'd gone to the hospital and she was actually um, 12 months of chemo and she'd actually had a situation where she was about to give up the chemo. She'd had enough for like 12 months in. It's like, I'm not doing this anymore. And he said to me, look, she wants to write a book. She's written this book while she's having chemo. So nobody's got any excuse, right? Right. Cause if you're going to write a book and while you're having chemo, then you can yeah, write a book yeah. anytime, right? Yeah. Uh, she wrote this book and you wanted to publish it. And I said, well, I'll help you. It'll help get it done. And he said, well, we don't have a lot of time. She's not going to make it. I don't think. Mm-hmm. Right, I think she's not going to make it. And, and I didn't hear him for a couple of months. And then suddenly he says, oh, she's in remission. And she's actually survived it. And she's actually got through. And then we published a book and she's actually become a nurse. And so the whole story moved on from there. But the reality was, I think he gave her hope. I think yes. what happened, him going to see her actually made her Believe step up and listen and start tomorrow. saying, I'll keep with the chemo. I'll keep going. I'll, yeah. I'll get through this. Like that last little bit. And that's what happens. Like it's, right, Same with writing a book. That last little hurdle, that last page. Yeah that last press the button, when we send the book out for them to proof it, the whole engine stops. <laughs> There's <laughs> dead silence. There's crickets, right? <laughs> so we send it out. It's like, oh, and all the self-doubt comes in. Oh, can I? I had one the other day. Can we change the title? I go, no. <laughs> and I said, besides the fact that we've thought out this a lot and the title she wanted to change because some well-meaning friend told her, oh, no, I think she should call it this. I was like, no, too late now. We set the path. Let's go for it. Right, you've got to trust the process then. So sometimes you can't, at some point, you've got to stop self guessing yourself, you know, second guessing yeah. yourself. Well, I mean, it's a lot like cancer and other diseases. I've mm. personally known people that have died from the diagnosis, not the yes. disease. Yeah, that's and right. in, a, in a way, that is, you know, the author's not publishing. Um, mm. I've also mm. come across authors that have self published. And I said, oh, I'll interview you on your book. Oh, no, 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 no. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't be interviewed. And they said, well, why did you write the book? Who is it yeah. for? You know? You owe it to the world. Yeah. If you've got something yeah. to say, you owe it to yes. the world to tell them and you owe it to the world to put your ego aside in that spread. That's ego to a degree. Yes, a fear ego world. too. You know, it's a, you know, um, not a, you know, a, I'm important a ego, but a fear ego. And, and the mm. thing is, is, again, who are we to to judge what you've written until we've mm. written it and we're not here to judge we're here to see mm. if your story is relatable to us because yeah. that's really what it's all about you know i'm going to read or see some stories and go no i'm not at all interested in that subject and then mm. there's something else that oh that's my cup of tea you know mm. and we talked about being yourself i have a little sign that i have out there i'm not everybody's cup of tea but i'm somebody's strong cup of coffee you know i i am what i am and it took me a long time for me to be comfortable with me and you know uh, and i'm not going to be offended if i'm not your cup of tea that's okay and i think that's what we need to do with the book isn't it with the book you can't sell everyone yeah trying to sell a book to everyone if you're harry potter even harry potter books right i've never read one Right. Oh, I have. They're actually wonderful. I love them. <laughs> I'm the nerd. So, I mean, so you're passionate about it. I didn't even. I, I watch the movies, and I like. I've got some of them. It doesn't do do anything for me. I don't know why, but it doesn't do anything for yeah. me, right? And so I'm not their market. That's okay. Right. That's a lot of other people, yeah. right? But it doesn't mean they're sold to everyone. So if she sat there and got upset, she's you know these people didn't like my book. There's also people that don't like stuff. Like you can't have seven billion people like the same thing. Yeah. So I think the thing is, you got to, you know, you got to be really so that your book is written for one person. So when we write, when we tell people to write a book, we go, can you write the book to one person, right? Not the masses, just to one person. If possible, put yeah. their photo up while on yeah, the screen. Yeah, exactly. Doing it. Who is this for? You know, it's um, you know, I, I with with the podcasting, you know, people say to me, yeah. how many people listen? I said, all those that are ready to hear. Yes. And it's the yeah. same with the book. All those that are ready to receive your message. It's yes. not for you to know who, where mm. or what, unless they happen to reach out to you and say, thank you. Half the time, you'll never know who's mm. read your book and how it's changed their life. Um, yes. Unless it's something where they come back to you and hire you uh, because of the service that you have. But you don't do it for that reason. You do it that if it can help one person, that's one person that's been helped that wasn't helped before. Mm. 
Exactly. One thing I, there's a good tip for authors if they get stuck because people like to pull people down, right? They like, right. To, yes, of course. Right. And so what they'll do is I'll say to this magic thing, how many books have you sold? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes, Oh, if they know they'll tell them, but some people don't really quite know. And they'll fumble with the answer. I say to them back, how much money did you make last year? I think, yeah, that's a personal question. I go, you just asked me a personal question. I'm a professional author. You asked me how much money I earn. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that a personal question? Yes. <laughs> Yes. And they go, oh, good point. Mm -hmm. And they'll let it go, mostly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, mostly, unless they're antagonists, yes. <laughs> yeah, and they'll push through. But the reality is, okay, well, let's tell me, tell me, give me a look at your balance sheet. Let me look at how much money you made last year. What's on your bank, right? And so those are all right. personal questions. I said, you yeah. just ask me a personal question. Yes. Right? Yes. And I think that's the problem is that some people will back down from that. Oh, I didn't sell, I'm not good enough. I didn't sell enough books. So it's right. not about, if you sold, what, like, in some respects, I believe that when Michael went and saw this girl, I think it was via his book. So his book saved a life probably. Yeah. All right. Yeah. One life. doesn't matter. One life's good enough, right? You say and one and that one life. light now is a beacon of hope for others. And that exactly. is what we need to look at is what is the ripple effect? Yeah. One right. thing. It's one person. Mm -hmm. You change one person's life. That's yes. good enough. For me, yes. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, and we don't know. It's, you know, whenever we write or whatever we do, mm. it, we're, we're sharing Mm. You know what, uh, for me, I'm a, you know, a blogger and yes, I'm going to be writing this book, but you know, I will just literally share a perspective mm. on something and yeah. it's always coming out with, well, what did I benefit from it? Even if it's a negative thought, what do I benefit from it? Mm. And if mm. people can read something and go, okay, you know, I relate that. I feel like that too. Like, mm. you know, I'm open with the fact that I've dealt a great deal with depression Mm. And, you know, people saying to snap out of it, you know, it's offensive. So, mm. you know, talking about that, but then talking about what I do to help yeah. myself now becomes, oh, I haven't tried that because mm. it's not, mm. oh, you've got to do this. It will work. It's yeah. got to be, here's something else you can try. See if mm. it works for you. Yeah. And that's you become a scientist. You become, a, you know, hope, you become right? a guinea pig on yourself, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. nobody knows everything. <laughs> no, and are we meant to? No, that's why there is a library of books. There isn't mm. one book that you know that speaks to all. Not even the mm. Bible. Sorry, folks. <laughs> exactly right. So one thing I think about, right, is that no matter what book you write, if you publish it on Amazon or publish in general market, that's a legacy by default, right? So yeah. you're there forever. Your book is now there forever, and very few people actually write a book. Like less than one. Not I think statistically, ninety percent of people want to write a book less than 1% ever do. Right. So that small majority of people, we say, oh, 3 million books on Amazon or whatever, but there's 7 million people on the planet. That's a tiny number when you think about it. Right. So that legacy of leaving that book, and we've had scenarios lately, something interesting lately, people are writing books about their life, but they're not publishing them. Mm. So what they're doing is giving them to their family as a history of what happened. Right. Now, that's interesting because that never used to happen before because the grandma would tell, yeah. you know, the, the, the mother down the track and it's not happening anymore. People aren't passing this information on and what happened in their lives. So one of the things is that even if you want to write a book, but doesn't ever want to publish it, um, you know, cause the family died about a year ago mm -hmm. and they'd written a book about their family and, mm -hmm. and my wife was reading the book and said, so, Oh, stuff I didn't know about him. Right. Was in so yeah. sometimes it's not just writing a book out there for someone to, the world to read. Sometimes you don't want the world to read it. You actually just want your immediate family to have access to the information about you in a nice, presentable way. Yeah, so yeah. I actually, I actually did a show on that on on the the legacy of of writing, mm -hmm. um, of you know, literally something down in words, you know, mm -hmm. because it is something then that people will revisit at different times in their life and get more you know, get things mm. out of it according to what they're going through. And yeah. so it's a way of you continuing on and understanding. Mm. Um, mm. Even if there's conflict in the family, you can write it when they're ready, they can read it and then maybe yeah. understand why what happened happened, right? So, exactly, yeah. you know, don't, oh, nobody will read it. Well, if it's there, they just may, right? That's they just may. In that scenario, so, you know, it's not like just the immediate family now anyway, so it doesn't matter, right? right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's pretty yeah risky, Risky writing legacy books because you know, that's what all the stuff comes up. So to me, get a book written. Possibly your first book might, might, might not be your last book. Right. And what you'll do is you look back at your first book and go, like I've got five books I've done. I really need to get back to my first book and, and fix it up. Yeah. It's yes. okay, but it's, no, you know, like it's like, your first, like your first one is not always the best one. 
Well, like you, you know, as you've got there, you know, you're evolved publishing, evolved preneur, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. our lives evolve. And so mm -hmm. a statement that was written, you know, a while ago is no longer mm -hmm. relevant. And so it's just kind of updating, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. that it's current. Otherwise, somebody may read that and then, oh, but you're mm -hmm. not there anymore. No, I've evolved. Exactly. And, the, you know, yeah. and the content just needs to reflect that. So Yeah. And, and I make a big mistake in the book where I put a lot of links in it. And yes. I say a lot of people, when you do books, don't put a bunch of links in books because those links expire. So have right. one link. They get to one place and then direct traffic from there. Right. Yes. And I've seen that happen so many times. You click on these links or they make them really long links and they don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And you end up in a situation where you, you've kind of lost that customer straight away. Their impression of you is gone. Like as soon as the link doesn't work, their impression of you goes down dramatically. Yes. Like yes. Bad news. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Bad really bad news. Um, and if there's something that you want to reference, I suppose you can always put the little star to it and then you can have yeah. that reference thing in the back yeah. of the page, you know, where you can go to that or, or on that or on, on the one link, mm -hmm. the references are here and you can click to all of yeah. that. So that's yeah. where, you know, if it's marrying your book to your website, yes. where there is that synergy where, okay, I've read the book. Now I want to know more. And I can go to your website and, and, I, and I want that 15 minute conversation with you. I want to know what, what, exactly what your services are and I want yeah. to book you. So yeah. your site must always be complimentary, right? And ready to receive. Exactly. Yeah. And, not, and, and test to make sure it works, by the way. Um, yes. Had yeah. it had a form fill out and it doesn't work. They never tested it. Um, so they build everything and then they roll it out. They forgot about it and they moved on. Yeah, exactly. Because there's something else that's attracted their attention. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I call it the you yeah. know, the squirrel effect. Squirrel. You know you can talk about the next thing about processes and stuff like that, because that's that's a big big problem that happens a lot is that that um, scenario where you go out in all these different tangents, you end up with forty different websites, and you end up with all these different things, and you realise that you've actually confused yourself so much that you know, it doesn't even know what you're doing anymore. Right. Right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and you need a website like I got I go for probably 40 websites and we just recently put them all together because my idea of a website, because I could, um, was I would develop a website so that I actually could remember what I wanted to sell, right, as a brochure. Mm -hmm. And so I'd right. create this website and then I'd have another one and another one, another one because I had staff that could do it. So it's far easier than doing a brochure. What happens is you just get all these websites and there's no connection to anything. Right. And so when we went back and reviewed it and I transferred all my websites to my own platform, what are, we culled off half of them. Now that doesn't make any sense anymore. Well, that can right. go there and pushed and compressed. And yeah. that's the thing about books, same principle is you're pushing and compressing your business down to one important thing. The old 80, 20 year old, you're like, what's the most important part of your business that generates the most revenue. That's what you focus on. Not some new shiny thing that might not work out. Right. Exactly. So, you know, it's also kind of don't, don't, you know, overdo it. I mean, you can anticipate mm -hmm. to a point, most yeah. certainly drive them traffic back to the site to want to know more but this mm. is something else a lot of people do with their sites is that they build it or they pay someone to to do it for them and they don't yeah. keep it current yeah. uh, or they don't you know have them copyright 2003 yeah <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. Mm. 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 and the stagnant site kind of says well are you out of business yeah, so, yeah. Question. you know and this is because mm. the fun principle, fear, worry, and doubt. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you did a tip there. I mean, now let's just talk a little bit before we go into our other show on, um, mm. on the marketing side of it. I interview a great deal of authors. And, mm. you know, we talk obviously about the book, um, but we also talk about the platform of what drove yes. the book, what the book is all about and what they're leading back to. Mm. You have got to be willing to do the circuit once you have your book. As you yes. said, it's not just, oh, I've got the book now, what am I going to do with it? Mm. You've got to be willing to go on the podcast and willing to, to write articles and willing yeah. to do public speaking because that is the only way that your book is going to get noticed. Part of the gig. The other thing yeah. too is what we, we said a lot of people like, like taking back to the children's book thing. When I mm. said to the question, how many people have you, got now as customers or surveyed or anything, no one. Do you have a Facebook page? Do you have right. any sort of connection to this customer base? No. And I go, well, how do you even know this book's even going to work? You haven't even asked anybody. Mm -hmm. And so what we say to people is you should be building your platform and, and people don't understand what that means, but it's, just, it's who follows you yeah. long before you write your book. Right. So if you're going to write a book, start building a platform and start connecting to people now 
Um, there's an interesting thing in, in Amazon called pre-order where you can actually put a book up there mm -hmm. and you've got 90 days to deliver that book. So you can actually sell the book before it's even written. Just all you need is a cover and some right. basic text that you upload. So what happens is you can actually go up there and start attracting a marketplace for that book. If something along the way, you know, you might change your cover, your title because of the feedback you get from people. Mm -hmm. Great marketing, right? Costs right. you nothing technically to do because... And but we put some rules around there. You must, you've got to deliver this book or we'll get banned by Amazon. But the reality is, is that that's a great way to start building up. Like we say to them, send out your book covers, get people involved, mm -hmm. send out your title, start your journey, start talking to your people about you writing the book. Guess what happens now? You it's can't back off that now. No, right? no, no. You no. told your people you're going to do something. Yeah. And you yep. don't do it. It looks bad on you, right? But it's also and building up in an excitement. You know, an exactly. anticipation from out. people. Oh, well, when's the book coming out? Mm. You know, um, mm. and that and that it gives you more incentive to complete it. Um, yeah. But it's also that excitement that's there. You know, um, yeah, you, you know what some people do is even uh, share some statements from it or a snippet from yeah. it, or leading chapter, up to yeah, or a whole chapter. Yeah, you know, it's a. But you've got to be willing to do the marketing, the participation. You've got to do the work. You've got to do the work. This, the work does, as you say, it doesn't stop at the end. You know, <laughs> that was just chapter one in the process. It's no step in the process of publishing the book. Exactly. And I yeah. think that's the thing you've got to kind of be prepared for. And I think what happens is getting that, that story right and getting that customer base to start with ready to buy by the time you get there. So you look at any, like movies are the best one to look at. Star mm -hmm. Wars, which is coming out in a couple of weeks' time, they started that story a year ago, mm -hmm. right? They started marketing that, um, like the Avengers movies marketed yeah. a year out. They're building an arc. They're building all this media attention around it. What's yeah. the movie going to be about? And it's, how's it going to end? And all these things. And they keep it kept all secret so no one knows because the idea is it generates people's uh, curiosity yeah. and, and, and stuff like that. And so at the end of the day, <clears throat> you've got to think about a pre-planning process now, one of the things that the traditional publisher does is it takes them two years to publish a book. Right. So what happens is, and at the same time, and the good thing about a publisher is you've got all these eyes on it. So over that period of time, all these people's input. When you're doing it yourself, you end up, no one's looking at it. No. And there's no one to push you to finish it. No one checking on what you're doing. So what happens is you really on your own sort of journey. If you're really good at that stuff, great. If you're good at project management, most people aren't. It's whether they didn't get it finished in time. It comes up haphazard and then they go cheap on something like the cover. And so all those things fail in the process. But uh, two years out, the publisher will start promoting that book. So that's coming. So that's mm -hmm. the thing to remember is that you, you don't just suddenly, it's a snapshot in time. Hey, hello, everybody. I've written this book. And it's like, um, what book? <laughs> yeah. and, and you've lost that chance of actually right. having that, that build up to it. Right. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about writing the book is, you know, put your money where your wisdom is. You know, mm. you, you've written this book, pay the money that is going to make sure it's done properly, that it's going to reach the right people, that right. it really is going to be something that represents you and that you're proud of, mm. you know, and we're inclined to kind of go cheap. Sometimes it's all we can afford. Okay. Yeah. But you know, the thing is, it's like with anything else is that this is an investment mm. and the return might be that it's just a book you want to get out there and sell, mm you know, or it's a giveaway, but the whole point of it, it is an extension of you. Um, mm. You know, people keep asking me for my book, but what's your story, Sarah? You're always mm. sharing everybody else's story. What's your yep. story? And yeah. we say a great deal of the time when you are successful, but people would like to have a book because in some way it's a little validation, mm. you know, mm. of who you are, that you yeah. are actually a, a printed author. Yeah. Um, and so one has to look at the reasons of why you're doing it and what you want from it. And which means also you need to invest in it. So if yeah. somebody wants to publish a book, what is your process that you do with them? Um, so basically what happens, we wrote a book called book publishing secrets for entrepreneurs. So I'm going to try and show you that book without having too many problems with the screen. Um, and so that book we wrote was designed around and, and in that book, we wrote everything, um, about the process almost so we actually have because it's what we have the conversations with the clients with on the normal way right so we kind of wanted to train them right. so normally what happens is we have that conversation so we usually have an appointment they go to a website and basically they book an appointment and we have a conversation we have an hour's conversation no obligation if there's a fit and and there's a, you know they can afford it 
and there's a and it makes sense, then we'll go to the next comp and we'll we'll talk about how much money it's going to cost and all that kind of stuff. Right. But the first part's just a conversation because um, most author, most publishers will take on submissions for books and read the books. I don't want to see the person. I want to talk to yeah. the person. The book doesn't matter to me so much until I can talk to the person, figure out what sort of ability they've got to sell this book. You know, what do they want? What's their story? What are they trying to put out there? And then how can we help them get where they want to be? And and back to that children's author, she said to me, I said, well, what do you want to do? What, what's the reason for doing this? I want to publish a book. I said, well, why are you making this so hard for yourself? Yeah. Just do a book, publish one book. Yeah. And then move from there. Publish a simple book. Mm -hmm. like just get it done. Then it's out of the way. You're a published author. Then you've got the credibility. Then start doing this bigger book and fancier book then. Yeah. You build your market. And that's the thing you've got to be careful of. So having the conversation with someone is very important to me to figure out whether there's a fit and whether we're even going to get on, right? Well, yeah, um, because if, if, if we, you know, again, that synergy is the same with your clientele. Yeah. You want people to read this book and go, okay, this person's talking to me. I now want to reach out to them. It's the yeah. same with you and the clientele of your authors. If yeah. you're both talking it from different angles or together and not meeting in the middle, how can yeah. you represent them? Yeah. How can you guide them? So there has to be yeah. a synergy. You kind of have a rule too. If you, they make the appointment, they show up. Yeah. If they don't show up and there's a good reason for not showing up, great. But they don't do it again, show up a second time. Right. My kind of litmus test is if you can't book an appointment and show up, then how am I going to get you to do anything? Right. Yeah. I can't get you to do that. And we have people do that all the time. Like, and I was like, oh, no. Because I know you won't show up. You won't do what I ask you when I have to ask you to do stuff. When you have to write that bio, mm -hmm. or give me the feedback on the book or check the formatting. I know you're not going to do it because you can't show up. <laughs> right. So, and um, so you don't, you know, paid or not, you don't want to waste your time. You'd rather put your no. effort in the people that are serious. And that's really how Life we should all our businesses, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, in all of our businesses, that's mm -hmm. the thing is you want to serve the people that want to be served. And that yeah. means participation. Mm, right. Exactly. And if you're not willing to participate in the process, if you're not willing to listen, learn, mm -hmm and apply, then you're not going to get the results you want. And that's in every aspect. Yeah. So um, how do people reach out to you per uh, pertaining to the authors? So probably evolveglobalpublishing.com. Um, they want to check me out, johnnorth.com.au, those two sites. Both have got appointment buttons to click on. <laughs> um, right. And so basically we don't really take forms as such because we found the forms don't work. People fill that forms mm -hmm. for the hell of it. So we just say, look, book an appointment and we'll ask you a couple of questions on the way and then we'll go from there. Right. So that's, but evolveglobalpublishing.com has all our authors up there, all our books. They can see what we've done um, and a few testimonials about these authors and they, what they've done. But <clears throat> it's more about having a look at their body of work um, and seeing whether there's a fit into what they want to do. And we've published books from one angle, one end of the spectrum to the other, like, uh, we've done children's books. We've done all sorts of you know, interesting books on the other end of it, which we can't talk about. Um, you know, I mean, like there's lots of things that books we've done. So it's not like we've done one sort of book. Right. Uh, we've probably done, we've been involved about 350 books, but I've published about a hundred. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you've got to feel for us as well. So if you don't yeah. feel it fits in your market, then don't book an appointment. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, like, That's what this show is right? all so about. Do you, do you get them? You do you like what he's saying? Mm. Then reach out. And so that's John yeah. North. Um, is that dot com AU? AU, yeah. Yeah, yes. so it's John North dot com dot AU for Australia. Yeah. And uh, and it's evolve global publish publishing dot com. Dot com, yeah. The dot right. AU will work as well, but dot com's easy. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, the book publishing secrets, I mean, they're all right here. All you have to do is mm. just put John North in here at Self Discovery Media and you'll see his shows. But yeah, the next show that we're going to be doing, which um, I invite you to go over and listen to, is actually the one on um, the Evolvepreneur on actually uh, the structure of building a formatted site. Just give a little window of what we're going to be doing here and we invite people to come over and listen to that one. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. So it's, uh, this is all about your business that we're going to be doing about and what you can do for people other than just the publishing, also in the structure of the building of the site, automating, building that site that when you have sold your book and then people go to it, they can actually see, you know, mm -hmm. your professionalism, uh, easy 
easy um, stages for people to go through. And that's what we all want. We really want to have the time to actually work with the client and not all that background stuff that is tedious time. So you automate all of that. So please come on over to, to listen to that show. You will find it here on this link. Again, you put in John North under Self Discovery Media or on discoveringcommunities.org. And he's one of our mentors. And you will find him uh, and all that he offers you in all of the programs. So thank you very much, John, for this uh, first show and uh, look forward to the second show and discovering all the other stuff that you do. Cool. No worries. Okay, folks. Don't forget mentors membership go and check it out check out also what he's doing for us because if you're in business there's some things that you need to know in order to be actually able to serve your clientele so until next time bye for now we hope that you enjoyed the show to find many more shows of inspiration please go to selfdiscoverymedia.com podcasts and you will see an array of shows to choose from please do visit our triple w discoveringcommunities.org and see what else that we have in store for you. Do enjoy our next show.